right. Uh, so my name is Mark Amsmeyer. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a senior UI developer at Pure Cars. Um, we are a um, digital marketing and automation firm in the automotive industry, and uh, our office is in um, Peachtree Street, right where West Peachtree Street connects. Um, I also moonlight as a consultant. Uh, my brother and I own a consultant company uh, called Kansas Meyer Software Company. Um, I also love NFL football and Walter Frisbee. So. Um, so, who has experience with React? All right, very few. Okay. Uh, so, I'll give a quick intro. Um, for those who haven't used it. Some of the stuff I'm going to talk about is probably going to be a little bit over your head if you haven't played around with it or don't know some of the concepts behind it. Um, but it's good information if you ever do want to look into it. So. Um, React uh, is basically a library for building modern UIs. Um, it's got an extremely lightweight API. Um, it's really simple to grasp. Um, it's, it's declarative, um, you know, it's like HTML where you define, you know, you have a component and you provide props, you know, to your component properties uh, declaratively. Um, and all of the components are composable, so um, you can wrap components in other components and compose your application by building up a tree of, of components. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking with React, when you're thinking about things, you have to think about them um, kind of like this, where you've got your outer app component, and then inside of your app component, you've got a search component, uh, and a list component, and a title component, uh, and a row component. And so you think about things as individual components, as pieces of a whole. Um, and as a developer, it's really, it feels good to um, work that way because you can really, you know, encapsulate everything inside of this one component and just drop it into any project that you're working on. So, um, and then how many of you are familiar with Redux? Okay, so a fair share of people are familiar with Redux. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, um, I'll go through the five minute spiel on, on Redux and um, the benefits of it. Um, and flux in general. So there's this concept that Facebook kind of championed um, a couple of years ago called flux. Um, and basically what it is is with a traditional MVC, you've got a uh, controller that um, basically provides data to a bunch of different models. Uh, and then you've got a bunch of different views uh, that communicate with these models, whether it's getting data from them or um, user interaction with view triggers updates in the model, um, and then your model has to somehow get data back into all these other views. So you just get this big tangled mess of all these different uh, views that have all these dependencies on these, these different models and vice versa. Um, now with Flux, uh, it kind of turns that concept on end. Um, with Flux, you've got a single store for all of your data. Um, and the big thing with Flux is it's a single way data flow. Um, so essentially what you're doing is you've got your view, uh, your view gets data from this single store, and all of your views get data from this single store, uh, and your views can't actually mutate data in the store directly um, at all. Uh, the only way that they have to mutate data is by dispatching an action, okay? And an action is just an object that has a type and it has maybe a payload, and then your store knows you know, how to handle that action and mutate data to reflect you know, what that action is supposed to do. So that's kind of the quick overview of Flux. You've also got this like dispatcher that kind of handles everything. You can kind of think of him as the air traffic controller that you know, anytime an action is dispatched, it sends it to your store and kind of handles what to do with that action. So Redux uh, is basically an implementation, a popular implementation of the Flux architecture. 
Um, the creator calls it a predictable state container for JavaScript apps. Um, it has a single store for all application state. Um, some fun flex implementations actually do have multiple stores and um, are updated, you know, those stores are updated and connected to by multiple views and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Redux has a single store for all application state. And you never modify state directly. Uh, and actions are dispatched and reducers um, are basically pure functions that know how to mutate state based on the action that's dispatched. So why does Redux help applications scale well? Uh, first things first, it's really easily testable. Um, here we have a reducer. Um, the footprint of a reducer uh, is basically a pure function that takes in state and it takes in an action. So state, this is the current state of the store and the action has a type. Okay? So you basically have string constants that uh, define your types. And what a reducer does is it goes, okay, I'm going to look at the type and if my type is uh, add to do, uh, I'm going to take the action, the text that's on this action, and I'm going to add a new to do in my state. Um, this is ES6 syntax, so if you guys aren't familiar with it, um, you know, basically all you're doing here is you're cloning your state and then you're adding a uh, new to do into your to do's array. Um, and what this does is it, it, it makes it super easy to test because all you have to do now is import your reducer. Um, you define your initial state here. So the initial state in this case is just an empty list of to-dos. And the action, you also define an action in your test. Um, you put the type, add to do, the text is right unit tests. So then if you're actually testing this thing, um, you're basically you know, calling this reducer function with your initial state in your action, which gets you the new state, and then you're just testing and asserting that um, the, the text of the first to do is equal to the action text, and completed as falsy, because that's the behavior that this producer uh, is supposed to do. It's supposed to add a to do to this uh, list, and then it's also supposed to um, you know, set the completed value to false. Uh, it's also extremely easy to reason about. Um, actions and reducers being pure functions with no side effects, um, it just helps you to um, be able to reliably predict how your application is going to respond to these actions. Um, anytime an action is emitted, the same action is always going to have the same result. So there's no side effects. Um, it's got a good separation of concerns. Uh, all your business logic is kept out of your views. Um, it's in your actions and reducers, which are, like I said, the pure functions that are really easy to test. Uh, the same action is always going to result in the same outcome. No matter where it came from, it could be dispatched from um, you know, another action, it could be dispatched from your, your view, it could be dispatched from anywhere. The same action is always going to have the same result on your state. Uh, and then the, the other thing is that the developer adoption is fantastic. There's a strong community of React and Redux developers uh, who support Redux, and uh, this was you know, captured a couple weeks ago. I'm sure it's gone up by now, but it's got extremely strong adoption from the developer community. Um, and another thing that has is uh, it's got middleware. So um, you can actually enhance the base functionality of Redux with uh, middleware. So it basically provides a third party extension uh, between when an action is dispatched and it actually um, reaches the reducer for you to do something with that action. Uh, you can be used to log the actions, you can use it for crash reporting, you can use it to fire off uh, web requests, you can you know, use it for routing, you can use it for so many different things. Um, and there's already some insanely great middleware out there that third-party developers have, you know, open-sourced. It makes Redux, Redux so much better than free. And before we get to some of the best practices um, and pitfalls that you might encounter whenever you start scaling your React or Redux application, uh, I want to do a quick primer on 
bootstrapping a React application really quickly and easily with React boilerplate. Um, so one of the hottest topics of 2015 and 2016 uh, was JS tool fatigue. I mean, the struggle was real, y'all. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of developers out there developing new plugins every day. Um, you know, this little comic strip about competing standards. Oh, now we're going to develop a new universal standard to rule them all. And now there are 15 standards, right? It, it happens every day. Um, so it makes bootstrapping modern JavaScript apps really tedious and, and you know, just hard to do. So React will play to the rescue. Uh, it is the most production-ready, stable solution that I found. There are a lot of different, like, bootstrap, boilerplate type apps, um, or type projects for React, React and Redux. Um, but this one gives you so many things that you're going to need for uh, large production applications out of the box. Um, it follows really good practices for large React apps. Um, you define things by feature rather than lumping all of your components into one place and all of your containers into one place and all of your CSS in one place. Uh, it, you know, grouping things by feature is a much more scalable way to do things. Um, it has server-side rendering out of the box. Um, a lot of the solutions that I found uh, don't really tackle this, so this is one of the huge things that I thought um, was awesome about React Waterplay. Uh, it does code splitting uh, and lazy loading when routes are loaded. Um, which is a really awesome feature whenever your code base starts getting past, you know, 50,000, 100,000 lines, your file sizes just get ginormous. So, um, code splitting, basically what, what it does is it uses Webpack to split your code into different modules, JavaScript modules, and then only whenever that JavaScript module is actually needed. Um, so say you land on a route, well now it's going to load all the JavaScript needed for that route. So you don't get all of your JavaScript loaded up front. And up front, you have to wait 10 seconds for your app to load. Um, it loads what it needs to load initially, and then loads new JavaScript as needed. And then it's also got uh, something called hot module reloading, which is great for local development. Um, basically, what this means is that any time you make a change, instead of having to refresh the page and lose your current state of your application, It'll actually just reload the component that you changed. So if you only made a change to one component, that component is going to get hot swapped out in the browser without having to reload anything. Really, really cool. And it allows you to keep your place in your application. So if you're you know, in the middle of adding to-dos and you want to see, you know, you've got three to-dos in your state, and you, won't, you don't want to have to refresh, add three more to-dos, and see how this application looks now. Um, this allows you to do that without having to refresh and you get to keep your current state. And it's also got ES6 support out of the box uh, and support for CSS modules and post CSS. Um, so it's just, it's, it's, the Webpack configuration is robust. Um, there's a lot of different settings that you can customize. Uh, there's a CLI for generating components and routes and containers. Uh, it's just an all around great starting point for bootstrapping your app. So now I'm going to jump into some of the best, best practices um, for scaling a React and Redux application. Um, the first best practice uh, is really about um, designing your components to be easier to reuse and reason about. Um, it's basically the practice of dividing your components into two categories. You've got smart containers and dumb components. <coughs> Does anyone have any questions so far? I've got a lot to cover, so I know I'm kind of going fast, but um, if anybody has questions, just feel free to raise your hand. So dumb components are what I call presentational components. Um, they don't know anything about your application. They're concerned with how things look. Um, they don't have dependencies on the rest of your app. So they don't access your Redux state. They don't fire dispatch actions. They don't do anything. Um, they receive data and callbacks exclusively via props. Um, so everything is passed in and it just renders it. So it's, it just knows nothing about your app itself. Um, 
So here's an example of a dumb component. Um, you've got your text being passed in via props, and you've got uh, this handler on change handler being passed in. Um, and all it's going to do is render a div with a paragraph that says your text, renders the text, uh, and then an input that um, sets the value of that input to text and has a handler for on change as your on change handler. Um, so there's no mutation occurring here. Um, nothing special, it's just rendering this stuff. Well, this is a very simple example. But, um, so smart containers are stateful. Smart containers have, um, they are concerned with how things work. Uh, they provide data and behavior to child components, whether they be other containers or dumb components. Um, they call Redux actions that access Redux state, and um, yeah, they're often stateful because they tend to serve as the data sources for your applications. Uh, so this is an example of a smart container. Uh, it imports an action from your actions. Uh, it accesses your Redux state via this map state to props function. Um, it dispatches action, it creates an action dispatcher um, and passes that down into the dump component. Um, so this is what handles all your business logic. It knows about your application, it's application specific. Um, you can't just pick this up and drop it into another application and expect it to work. Um, so the benefits of uh, thinking about your components this way is that you have better separation of concerns. Um, you understand your app and your UI better when you write your components this way. Um, you know that all of your containers are application specific and access state and mutate, you know, handle state mutation and that sort of stuff. And then you know that all of these dumb components can be dropped into any application and reused. Um, it's just a really nice, clean line of delineation. Um, and you also get better usability, reusability, um, because you can use the same presentational components for different state sources. Um, you can use them in different applications, like I said. Um, and then it also effectively gives you a library of UI components that you can use. Um, and even like up upload it to an NPM, publish it as an NPM package and use it on any of your projects in your organization. Um, and this is a really cool you know, side effect of this because you can actually let UI designers tweak these components without affecting any of your um, business logic and the functionality of your application. So the best practice number two is uh, using immutability in your app. Um, so has anybody heard of immutability? A good amount of people. So before I go into the what, let's talk a little bit about the why. Um, the quality checking in JavaScript. If anybody's done it, um, you know it's painful and uh, it's not performant, especially for deeply nested objects and big arrays and that sort of stuff. Um, the quality checking primitive values like Boolean strings, integers, etc. It's really easy because they're always checked against. Uh, this, the value, the actual value. Um, it gets a little hairy then you, know, you start comparing functions, complex objects, or complex types like functions and objects. Um, in this example, you've got these objects, they're obviously the same, they pass the eye test. Uh, in JavaScript, they are not the same. Okay? And the reason is because when you are equality checking complex uh, types like this, they're actually compared by their reference in memory and not by the actual object shape, um, not by the actual value. So you can see the kind of problems that this might um, impose um, as your app grows because you need to fine tune performance in your app. Um, whenever you're doing a small app and you have small data sources and that sort of thing, it's not as big of a deal to uh, have no performance um, checks in your components. But whenever you start growing your app um, and your data sources and things like that become bigger and you've got more components being rendered on the screen, um, you start running into some serious bottlenecks for performance. Uh, and the way that you can actually get really good performance
formats is by using one of these should component updates lifecycle methods in React. Um, and basically what this does is it allows you to tell React specifically when you want this component to render. Um, by default, React is just going to render every time its props changes, the component prop changes. Um, with this, you, you, if you return true, it re-renders. If you return false, it does not re-render. So it gives you the next props um, that are going to be received by this component and the next state that's going to be received. Uh, and it allows you to perform some checks here. Okay? So I, for example, say I just use underscore is equal um, to deeply check the equality of these objects. Um, and if either of them is not equal, I you know, will re-render this component. Um, at first, you know, at first uh, glance, this doesn't seem like a big problem. Um, the only problem is once, like I said, once you start to get, you know, a lot of articles and deeply nested uh, properties in your user object, your performance is really going to suffer. Um, there's got to be a better way, right? So that's where Immutable JS comes in. Uh, Immutable JS is a library from Facebook um, to create immutable data structures in JavaScript. Uh, immutable data structures are essentially data structures that cannot be mutated. Once they're created, it's set in stone. It cannot be changed. Um, and what that gets you in JavaScript is referential equality on these things. So they will evaluate to true when you do a triple equals equality check. Um, now since you have referential equality, what you can do here is check to see, has this changed? Okay? And no, if it hasn't changed, it's not going to re-render. It has changed the order under. So you don't have the same performance uh, concerns with these immutable data objects. Uh, and what it also allows you to do is use this React add on shallow compare um, to shallowly compare your props and your state. Uh, so because now all you're doing is a referential quality check, you don't need to have any kind of deep equals or special logic. So you can just use this straight out of the box. So the benefits of this, obviously, it improves performance um, because you can get referential equality. Um, it simplifies your should component update um, calls. And because you can do shallow comparison of the entire props and state object, and it's easier to reason about because when you're mutating an object, it's much more explicit now. You actually have to return an no, object. Uh, and anytime that you mutate an immutable object, it returns a new instance, a new object that has the mutated you know, the changes. So I'm sure that in your history of JavaScript, you've changed a property on the object, and then somewhere down the line, it causes a bug because you actually changed the reference of it. So um, it just makes things a lot easier to reason about. The best practice number three is actually normalizing your state tree. Um, this is also known as like flattening your state tree. So there are certain kinds of deeply nested objects, um, specifically uh, objects that have um, relation, relational. Uh, so if you've got an author inside of an article, um, and then multiple articles have the same author, well, you're storing that you know, that author multiple times in state if you just plot three articles in state. Um, and since Redux is supposed to be the predictable state container, um, if you make a change to one of these objects, if you rename an author of one of the articles, well now you've got this one article that has a different author name, and then the other articles that have the same author um, don't get that change reflected on them. So it's not very predictable. Um, so here, for example, your API returns some deeply nested objects. You've got these two articles, and then this author uh, is clearly the same. It's got the same ID, the same name. Um, now, when you store these in Redux state, um, this is more like what it would look like. You'd have an articles, uh, an articles state tree, and then inside of there, you've got your two articles, and they have the same object here. But if you were to 
change this one to cancel wire, because some people spell my name that way. Um, well, now this one has been updated, right? So that's where something like normalizer comes in handy. Um, this will actually allow you to easily normalize your API responses uh, to prevent, say, duplication. Uh, it turns this into something like this. So this is the normalized result of this API response. Uh, we've got an entities table um, which has authors and articles. So it pulls out unique authors here and stores them in this entity table key by ID. And then you also get a unique table of articles key by ID. Uh, and then your result has your authors as an array of the you know, unique authors from this API response, and then articles as an array of uh, unique article IDs from this uh, API response. So let's look at an example, our previous example, and see how Normalizer solves the issue. Um, this is what your state tree would look like um, after you use Normalizer on that API response. So you can store your authors by ID, and then you can also have state that has the result, where it's the array of all the IDs. Uh, and then the same thing with articles. You've got the articles by ID, and then we've got the list of articles. Uh, so if an entity changes here, um, since you're referencing these things by ID, you see it also replaces the author with the ID of the author. And since you're referencing these authors by ID now, uh, if this author changes, everything in your application gets those changes um, for free. So um, it's just a, a much better way to store your state. And then here is kind of a, an uh, advanced example that kind of goes through different steps to create this. Um, can you all see that? So you've got down here, you've got your uh, action here, get article success, and this is where you're going to actually define your normalizer schemas. Um, so it allows you to do a couple of things. You get to define your nesting rules. So you define a schema here, articles, and then a schema for authors, and then you define your nesting rules here by using article.define, and then the key is the uh, key on the object of your API response and the value would be the schema for that uh, key. So basically all I'm doing here is saying that, okay, this is a, expecting an array of articles and an article has this author property that is a author schema. And then over here, you define your initial state for your reducers. So you've got by ID and then you've got all. Um, and this is a mutable map and this is an immutable set. Uh, and it's a set because you want only unique IDs here. Uh, and this is a map because it's a keyed map, so you want your IDs to be unique keys. Um, and then, effectively, you, you create this default reducer that um, handles your API response. It, gets, it checks to see if the action has an entities object, and if that action has um, entities for your schema that you're creating a reducer for. And then this handles merging in the new entities for articles and authors. So then here's your actual reducer. You've got your articles reducer here and your authors reducer here. So you set your state to the initial state um, using ES6 default, um, default arguments values. And then you switch on the type, so if it's update author, you're going to merge in your new authors. Um, and if it's or if it's an update author, that's saying that I'm going to update an author inside of here. So I, I check the action ID, and that would be the ID of the author. So I am basically merging inside of this by ID um, table. I'm going to merge in the new author data. So if I change the name. This would effectively copy the name from the action over into my um, author's table, so everything would get that updated author. 
And then I've got this default reducer. I'm passing in the schema name, which is this here. Uh, and this is going to just create that reducer that's going to um, handle the default case. And I'll do the same thing for article producer. Uh, at this time, I don't have any need for updating an article. I just have a need for updating an author, so I don't even uh, provide any other actions. Um, I just return the default producer and pass in the article schema. And then I create my root producer here, which just, this is a Redux um, method to combine reducers into a, um, you know, your root reducer tree. Um, and I pass in my author's reducer and my article's reducer. Um, this is made easier by creating Redux middleware, or you can use Redux normalizer middleware. Um, I prefer using that because it's just, you know, it's, you don't have to create your own. Um, you don't need to be able to it there. So the benefits of using a normalizer is it normalizes your deeply nested objects. Uh, it prevents duplicate state, and uh, normalization can happen in middleware, so you get it for free once you've got your middleware set up. Uh, so I'm going to go through these really quickly because we're running out of time. Um, but here's some of the problems that you're going to encounter when you start to scale your React Redux application, and some solutions to them. So problem number one is handling side effects. Um, Redux by default only handles synchronous actions. Um, so this basically is a problem, right? Because in real apps, you have to make API requests. You have to um, do things that are not synchronous. Uh, so how do you handle that? Um, in MVC apps, they handle that by, you know, you've got your API service, you've got your view. Uh, in your view model, you have this load books method that goes out to your API, gets the books, and then sets a property on the view model for loading to false um, and sets your books on the view model. Uh, and if there's an error, it sets an error property here. Um, with React Redux, um, you would create an action to view your books, but then you run into a problem, right? Because you're returning an action here. Um, you're returning a promise from your action, okay? And Redux is going to complain and say, there's an uncaught error. Actions must be plain objects use custom middleware for async actions. So what we really need is something that looks more like this. You've got your your actions here, um, and really there's three different states in your application that you need here. You need when the action when the books are requested, you need when the books come back from the API, or when the books request fail. <coughs> And then you need something to handle those three different actions uh, and update your state accordingly. So solution number one would be to use Redux Thunk. Um, a thunk action is effectively an action that returns a function and it gives you access to the Redux dispatcher. Um, it gives you a function to get the current state as well. So here's an example of you know, a case you might use this go to get uh, the current state, get the counter from there. If the counter is um, a division of two, you would get, uh, you know, you would just return. Uh, otherwise, you would increment. So you would only increment if it's odd. So, uh, we are about out of time, but Basically, this would be what it would look like with Redux Thunk. You create your get book, books thunk action. Um, it returns a function with dispatch and get state. You get books from your current state to see if they've already been fetched. If not, you dispatch your get books action. Um, then you make your request to go get the books. And then once your books come back, you dispatch success. If it fails, you dispatch your error action. And then the component, you just get, you know, fire this get books method, and your books and your is loading and your error, since they're stored in your Redux state, you would just, you know, after these things happen behind the scenes, your component doesn't really need to know about that business logic. Um, these things would just come and be loaded into this component automatically for you. 
So that's kind of Redux Cloud. You handle your side effects within your app for three years. Um, you're able to unit test them, but you have to mock your Redux store and also the HTTP requests. Um, it's not bad, but it could be better. It's going to go over Redux Saga. I don't think we have time for that. Um, but essentially, Redux Saga is a, is a separate thread. You can think of it as a separate thread. That only deals with side effects, so it's outside your, your kind of Redux um, actions and uh, reducers, and it just handles your side effects only, and can dispatch actions, and that's what it does. I was also going to go over using reselect to essentially create minimalized selectors um, that are only recomputed when their input values change. Um, so we can get better performance by that. And then I was also going to go over Redux Act to simplify creating actions and reducers. And that's that. Um, Maybe I'll do a part two to go over some of those uh, you know, drawbacks and pitfalls that you can run into. Uh, the conclusion is use smart containers and dumb components. Use immutable data to help performance. Um, normalize state tree helps with state duplication, um, makes your app more predictable. And conquer side effects with Redux Thunk or Redux Saga. Create performant, composable selectors with reselect and use Redux Act to reduce the plate and simplify. Here are links to all of those things. Um, if you want to check them out, I highly encourage you, if you've done any React Redux you know, work, if you do that on a daily basis, or if you do that on a side project, I highly encourage you to check these things out. Um, it has revolutionized the way I develop React applications. Uh, it's uh, revolutionize the way we do things at Pure Cars, and uh, there's a lot of good stuff there. So once again, my name is Joel Kanzelmeyer. Uh, you can find my Twitter handle here, and my GitHub here. I hardly have it on Twitter, but I will post out a link to this slide deck um, so that you guys can check it out. So um, I hate that I could get into more of it, but you know, we only have 30 minutes, so um, like I said, maybe I'll come back for part two. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, so, what's your thoughts about uh, still using React State, and if, like, should we just put everything in the Redux store, or are there a few things that you should use React State for, in your opinion? So, I think there's still a place for um, React State, uh, especially when it comes to like UI State, like for a single component. Like, let's say you've got a modal that you want to show uh, when a user clicks a button, and this modal is very specific, and it's only specific to that one page. Like, you might put that in React State rather than Redux State. Um, if, you know, I think the kind of where you would draw the line is, is this going to be used in multiple places? Can, do you envision this, you know, piece of state being used in different places in the future? That sort of thing, so. So, for your example of the modal component, uh, would that, would the, like, say, visibility state, would that be in the modal component of visibility? And how would you trigger the re-render? That, or where would the React State with all visibility reside? So I would say that that could live in a container. So if you've got your modal inside of a container component, um, and the only, you know, this is the only place this modal lives, and it's really just, like, say I want to click a button uh, that, like, opens a modal that has some settings <coughs> for this page, or, you know, just for an example, right? Um, and I've got this dialog you know, component in this container. Um, so, and I've also got this button in this container. So if this button is clicked, I might set the React state for that container to say modal open equals true, and then my container would re-render, and I would pass that container open, or dialog open state prop into my dialog, which would open it. So I'd say it would live there. Any other questions? <coughs> What's the best practice for dealing with like real-time data? Like where would you put that in React Redux? So um, there are uh, a few different ways that you can handle that. Um, I 
have done components, uh, or I've done an application that uses uh, web sockets before to um, kind of stream data in. And I've created middleware to handle those socket updates. Um, that would essentially, you know, you'd have a meta property that has the socket, you know, socket equals true or something like that, and it would just update, fire updates to your state. Um, it's a lot easier with, you know, I hate that I could get into it, but it's a lot easier with Redux Saga because you've got this, essentially this separate thread that can just listen to things so that um, the socket would fire an action and your Redux Saga would just watch and listen for that action and update your state accordingly. So that's kind of how you do it. What's your experience with uh, debugging with Redux? You know, you get tooling for that. Is, uh, is there any yeah. that you would recommend for that? So Redux has probably the best debugging suite um, that I've worked with uh, as a front end developer. Um, they actually have a Chrome extension uh, called. We're actually going to install here. It's just Redux Dev Tools, and you. You basically, it's a one-liner to set it up in your, your React application, Redux application. Um, and it just checks to see if you have the DevTools extension installed. And if it does, it will hook into it, and you can just use it. Um, if not, then it doesn't do anything. So, yeah. Redux DevTools. <coughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you for your time.